My name is Joe Vendramini, and I'm the forward specialist at the Range Cattle Research and Education Center. I'd like to thank you for participating in the webinar today. And the topic that I will cover today is the use of sun hemp as a cover crop and forage in Florida. Uh, sun hemp is a plant uh, originally from Asia, and it is a warm season annual legume. And it is a tall herbaceous plant. Uh, it can get up to six, seven feet tall. And usually for the, the cultivars that we use, it grow in one single stem where the leaves are attached to that stem. It's, it's widely used in tropical and subtropical areas. And the main use of sun hemp has been for many, many years uh, as a cover crop because of the really fast growth and the fact that it's a legume, it has the nitrogen fixation aspect and is also uh, present in the literature, the sun hemp can help you with some soil characteristics, uh, most in the nematodes and, and some microbes action. Um, and the, the genus of the sun hemp is Crotalaria, and it has all different plants. Um, the, the species varies tremendously, not only on the the morphology of the plant, but also in the characteristics of the plant, the physiology. And it is known that a lot of the Cretellaria plants, they have an alkaloid that is very characteristic of that plant. Although it is uh, noted that the alkaloid is most present in seeds, and it has been reports in the literature where the animals will eat the seed it may be toxic to the animals. So we have some uh, literature review from Auburn in 2012 showing that um, the animals received sun hemp in the vegetative state, so they didn't have any toxic effect on the animals, most ruminants. And But however, uh, although there is a large variation again in the species and the type of plants and in the, in the stage of the plant, the maturity, uh, it is recommended that the animals should not uh, consume the seeds because it's perceived that the seeds are the most toxic component in the plant. And now bringing here to Florida, um, we have about five years ago, there was a large interest in sun hemp, primarily here in South Florida from the vegetable producers, um, uh, strawberries, and, and in the Immokalee area around the, the bell peppers and, and other vegetables that they plant over there because they have a long time that the soil was uncovered waiting for the next crop. So they, they learn about sun hemp and, and most of the producers were really interested in this plant because of the benefits that can bring primarily to the soil and also suppressing the weeds and uh, tomato uh, producers as well here, they are, they are big users of sun hemp. And after they start using the sun hemp, they really like the production and the aspect of the plant. And there was an interest to, to see uh, if they could eventually use that plant as a forage, because a lot of these producers, they, they could market the hay of the sun hemp or, or even some of those vegetable producers, they do have uh, livestock as well, and so sun hemp could be a source of feed for the winter. And when we go to the literature and take a look at the all the information that we have, there were very little information about actually feeding sun hemp to, to ruminants and livestock. They have some reports, but actually scientific data, it, it, was, it was not present when you try to do a literature review. So we, we did, um, a few studies in these last six, seven years trying to cover both aspects of the sun hemp. And we try to, to see some of the benefits that it can have on the, on the soil standpoint. And also we try to, to use the sun hemp as a forage and see what will be the potential um, benefits that it can have on livestock. And I will show you now a series of data that we have collected over time. And I'll try to explain because they are different trials with different treatments. 
So one also, a, a question that, that we had that was quite important is there were, there are actually in the market, all these different cultivars. And in fact, they, they have different names and some people may call the same cultivar different names. And, and there was a lot of confusion because they, all, they were all called sun hemp. But we knew that a lot of these cultivars, they have very different characteristics. And that was primarily expressed in the price of the seed. So producers want to know they have a seed that was almost a tenth cheaper than the seeds from the, the cultivars that we had here for a little while, like Tropic Sun that came from Hawaii or AU Golden that came from Auburn. So why the seed is so much cheaper, right? And what will be the, the consequences of planting these different cultivars? So we test the cultivars that were available here commercially. And, and again, we need to be very careful with the name because commercially they may change the name, but those were the names that we found uh, locally here. And we did the harvest at two different times because those plants has really different physiology. So we harvest two months after we plant, like 60 days, a fixed time, or we wait for those plants to flower. In theory, when this plant is flowering is the peak of nitrogen fixation of the plant. So that's why we chose to be the flowering stage of the plant. And we saw that on the herbage accumulation here, we have a, a very different uh, um, outcome between those cultivars. So when we harvest at 60 days, it, they are a little more similar. You know, they don't have that full growth but we still see the tropic sun that is the one from hawaii and has a very expensive seed it's the one that produces the most it's still very attractive on the production standpoint and when you go to the flowering stage that's when you see difference and you see difference because the blue leaf and tropic sun they didn't flower so they keep growing through the whole growing season and we went to november october and they still didn't flower so in fact, the flowering time that I'm showing here in the last column may not be the time that it flower. It may be the time that we have to harvest because of we had a hurricane one year. And the other year is because the growing season was pretty much over and the plant was senescent, it was lo losing leaves. So those plants, they don't flower, they keep growing. That's why they have this tremendous greater forage accumulation here. But again, very different characteristics between cultivar you can accumulate much more forage if you use, for example, Tropic Sun. But again, it may be a matter of the price of seed. And we do have some producers that they have a fixed time to have that sun hemp in place that will not be more than two months because they follow up with a different crop. If that's the case, it doesn't matter. You don't want to pay a lot of money because in 60 days you have to harvest anyway. So you may use a cheaper seed. And this is just to illustrate the difference in the, in the extremes that I showed you. On the left-hand side with uh, yellow flowers, there you see the cultivar that they call Yubon, is one from Thailand. So it flowers pretty much 60 days or, or even 80 days there bef before we see that it always flowered. It is very insensitive to day length. When on the right-hand side, you see here the tropic sun that gets really tall and stemmy and keeps growing during the whole, whole uh, growing season. You can see those are, are, are very different plants, although they are the same genus and species, just a different cultivar. And on the, the soil aspect of the research, I think that was already reported in the, in the literature, we, we did an um, evaluation of the suppression of the nematodes in the soil, mainly the meloidogenous, that was the one that was uh, in the literature as the one the sun hemp has the greatest effect. And we saw most of these cultivars were very effective to suppress the nematode population. And we saw that there is also a good relationship between the herbage mass and the suppressing the nematode population. So the ones that produce more they do have a greater effect on the nematode population. And we believe is due to that some of the alkaloids and, and they are not host of the nematode. And also they have some uh, alkaloids that it goes from the roots to the tops that also help over time to suppress those nematodes. 
And on the, on the nitrogen fixation standpoint, as we know, is also very dependent on the herbicide accumulation. So you have a plant that will produce more and it is fixing nitrogen, it has a greater potential, right? To fix nitrogen, like tropicum produce more, it fix more nitrogen, but we still, we have some pretty good levels of nitrogen fixation on the sun hemp as expected. So this is one of the strengths of the plant. So we, we follow up with a little uh, research to try to see what is the time that the nitrogen is in the, in the material that you put back in the soil and how long it takes for the nitrogen to become available to the plant. And, and then we see that probably 80% of the nitrogen, about 70 to 80%, like after 200 days after you put in the soil, the nitrogen will become available to the plant when about 20% of the nitrogen may not be available because it's tied up to the fiber of the plant. Remember, these plants get really stemmy and mature and some of the nitrogen is tied up to the fiber. But we have a very fast decrease up to 50, 60% of the nitrogen that is in that plant may become available in the first 100 days. And that is a very desirable characteristics when you think about the subsequent crop that you're gonna plant because you have the slow release of the nitrogen that was fixed from the from the atmosphere in the plant and then is released over time in the soil. So that is one of the things that is, it's probably really attractive in that plant when you use it as a forage or as a cover crop. And another measurement that we are doing is still thinking about that soil aspect of the sun hemp is the microbial effect in the soil. In fact, that theory came, um, we had a sun hemp uh, summit in in Spain about two years ago, and we saw that uh, the vegetable producers, most of the vegetable producers in that area, it were most pepper, and they produce the vegetables inside of the greenhouse. So it's a very controlled environment. They start using sun hemp, and they noted that over time they they, they decrease the amount of fungicide that they need to use in the in the crop after they plant sun hemp. So with that in mind, we try to do some measurements. It's another trial where we just had three cultivars and we try to make a measurement about how that would help in decrease the amount of fungi that may cause some disease in vegetables here in Florida. And we have two treatments, the blue, is the one that we remove the plant from the top of the soil. We harvest the sun hemp as hay, so we remove it. And, and the, the orange bar, it means that we just harvest the material and we lay down the material on the top of the ground. You can see in general, we still need to, to finalize the second year, but in general, in the tropic sun and blue leaf, when we maintain that material on the top of the soil, again, it may be an effect of the releasing nitrogen and some of the alkaloids, it really decreases the fusarium population they will have in the soil after we, we harvest the sun hemp. So it's really promising. We are covering all um, five different pathogens. This is just some preliminary work that I think is encouraging and we're gonna have two years of that effect um, over time in different pathogens. So now I will switch to the forage standpoint. That's probably, it's the area that I, I, I really was excited about testing the sun hemp, mainly do because it's, it's my area of expertise and also because we have very little information in the literature. Um, we, we did a little trial where we tried to see the nutritive value of sun hemp over time. And there was a perception that sun hemp is always good because it's a legume. So it, it always has high nitrogen and, and good digestibility. But if you think about what I, I mentioned to you at the start of the presentation, the, the morphology of the plant is one big stem with leaves attached. So that big stem get really um, lignified and, and with a lot of fiber. So what happened is when we go from at four weeks, that sun hemp is still short and the, the stems are really tender, you can have some high levels of digestibility and protein. That's true, but you don't have a lot of herbage mass there. 
it's pretty much like any uh, hay operation. So if you harvest really early, you may have good nutritive value, but you are giving up on, on, on forage quantity. So if you let it go to seven weeks right before a flower or start flowering, you can have levels of 12% protein and about 60% digestibility. That is still a pretty good level of uh, nutritive value that will meet the requirements of most of our mature cows here, here in Florida. So that is, that is a summary of the nutritive value of that plant. And one thing that we also tried that were, were asked by producers is, how about if we bale, right? And you wrap because of the, the weather conditions, you have very little time to dry hay. And because some hemp has this thick stem, it takes a while to dry on the field. We, we have experience here that we, it took about seven to eight days to dry the material on the field. So we did some work with uh, silage where we just harvest and, and bale in round bales and wrap. And we see here, we have three treatments that is propionic acid to preserve the forage or to improve the fermentation of that silage. So the zero is pretty much the control. And when you see the zero treatment, you see that we got a silage that is almost unacceptable, that creates a lot of fungi. We have a, a high pH, no lactic acid. That is something that we really want on the forage and, and a lot of butyric acid. That makes that silage be really bad smell and, and have that fungi aspect and a lot of ammonia coming out. Like 50% of the nitrogen was converted to ammonia because of the bad fermentation. So when we add the propionic acid, we completely change that silage from being a really bad silage to 1% to a good silage, to a silage that will have acceptable pH, four and a half, and you see the levels of lactic acid are really favorable. So with that, you decrease the ammonia and you decrease the butyric acid to almost zero. So can you make silage or haylage or sun hemp? Yes, you can, but I would highly recommend you to use something to improve the fermentation such as propionic acid. If you decide just to do it as it is, it's very likely that you ended up with a bad fermentation and the material that may be refused by the animals later. It's still on the forage standpoint, we did another, another work that is um, how we, when we establish those warm season perennial grass, some of them take a while to come up, such as bahia grass and such as the, some of the brachiaris that we use here in South Florida. In this case is the caiman that's pretty similar to mulatto. You remember those those plants it takes about six seven months to establish so we are doing research to to see how we can uh, speed up the establishment they have some forage for the animals to graze in this fir first six months of establishment so in this graph here i will have here the caiman is when we plant the forage by itself right the mixture half we have half of the seeding rate of the caiman and uh, sorghum and um, sun hemp is a mixture of three species at establishment. And this, the mixture full, is when you put the full seeding rate. You can see here, when you have the mixture half, you a harvest one 60 days after planting, look at how much forward you have when you plant just the brachiaria. But when you add the sorghum and the sun hemp, you can add, actually have 25 100 pounds of dry matter there. That's a pretty good amount of forage. And you have a mixture of the sorghum and a lot of sun hemp in the first harvest. We know that the sun hemp doesn't regrow really well here. After you harvest, the first time after 60 days, you see that the participation of the sun hemp really decreases and will pretty much disappear in the second harvest. But it has a very good important uh, participation here in the first harvest. So sun hemp, may be used in establishment of this warm season perennial grass very effectively for us to have forage at the first six months. But remember, if you graze the sun hemp or harvest with the harvest, you're gonna have about 20% regrowth. So the regrowth will be very poor. Don't expect that the sun hemp will stretch. That's why we recommend to plant the sun hemp with sorghum or millet because that sorghum and millet will keep growing when the sun hemp will pretty much be gone.
And those are the pictures of the mixture here, 60 days after replant. And that's the final stand of the brachiaria. And this is the, the brachiaria planted by itself with no mixtures. And then is the same outcome probably after uh, six months after replanted. And we did make hay and fed the hay to the heifers. And um, what happened was, I'll, I'll explain to you what we did. We had the sun hemp by itself, 100% sun hemp hay, or we have 50% sun hemp hay, 50% Bermuda grass. Okay, the Bermuda grass was a jigs and it has the same nutritive value. The nutritive value of this forage was about 12% protein, 55% digestibility. And the third treatment was Bermuda grass by itself, just Bermuda grass. What happened was, when we increased the proportion of Bermuda grass in the mixture, we increased the intake of the heifers. So that means when you have just some hemp, the intake was lesser. And if you ask me why, we don't have a, a, a good explanation because the nutritive value was similar, but we think that it may be still the effect of some of the alkaloids that it has. So although it has the same nutritive value, um, the animals don't really like to eat the sun hemp because it, they, they may have a, a little effect there from the alkali. We The heifers were doing fine. They were actually keeping the weight on. And you can see here, this is the in vivo dry matter digestibility. You can see um, we, we didn't have any difference. In fact, this number here is wrong. 48 should be on the top and 52 should be on the bottom here. So when you have sun hemp, Bermuda and Bermuda, it was the same digestibility. The, the sun hemp was a little lower. So that may be why we had a little less intake, less digestibility, less passage rate, and we ended up with a less intake. But this needs to be a little further investigated why they ate the sun hemp with the same nutritive value and have lesser intake. And uh, finally, we had a little in vitro work where we have the room and fluid of the animals in the jar, and we add some sun hemp seed to the room and fluid. So we add zero, 30 or 60 grams of seed, uh, we ground the seeds of sun hemp that we know it has some alkaloid. So we add that to the rumen fluid. And, and then we add uh, star grass hay to the rumen fluid to see what would happen to the digestibility. And we saw that there was a linear decrease. So you, you enter more sun hemp seeds or that will carry the alkaloids in that rumen fluid, you see that there was a decrease in the digestibility of the forage. And now we know that it may have a little adverse effect on the microbial, the rumen microbial population, primarily due to the alkaloids. So we are following up on this research that is something that we got interested in and try to really figure out what would be the effect of those, the different types of alkaloids on sun hemp, uh, on, on the, the rumen fluid and the rumen microbe. And, we did a little follow-up work, and this is my last slide here that is still is not the conclusion. But one interesting thing, and when we have sun hemp hay, or we have sun hemp from two cultivars, right? And this is the whole plant. This plant here does not have flower, but this one had. This is the flower, and those are the seeds of the plant A and plant B. You can see, and this is a, a mass spec analysis for uh, abundance of different, all these peaks that you see are peaks of alkaloids that are in the same family of the pyrrolizid that is I mentioned to you. So pretty much what we found out was when you change the species or even the part of the plant, it's not that you have or don't have alkaloids. You just change a little bit the composition of those alkaloids and sheep shift it to a different type within the same family. So for example, this seed here, that's the one that we add to the rumen fluid. You can see how we have greater peaks here that are different, for example, from the hay. So, and I think the composition and the proportion of the alkaloids in this different part of the plants is something that we are interested in investigating now because we believe that that has a really great impact on the digestibility of the, the plant uh, in the rumen of the animal. So this is something that we are investigating now 
to try to figure out if you have different among species or what will be the best time to use some hemp to feed those animals. And again, uh, you can feed if there, there are no seeds, you can feed the sun hemp. We haven't seen any adverse effects. The literature is pretty consistent saying they will be fine. The animals may not like to eat much, but they may be a good source of forage. And we actually had some producers here in Manatee County that they fed sun hemp to dairy cows for a while and, and they didn't have any problems. So it is a forage that we can use, but I think we need to expand the knowledge and learn a little a little more about it. And if you eventually want to know more or have further questions about the Sanhem, please do not hesitate to send me an email. I'll be glad to talk to you about it. Thank you. I'm just going to share a few announcements with you all, things that we've got coming up. All right, so our next ONA highlight is going to be April the 13th, and that is going to be with a guest presenter. We're going to have some folks with the South Florida Bee Forge program here. It's going to be Lauren Butler and Lindsay Wiggins, and they're going to be sharing what they call an, an, a program appetizer. They're going to be telling a little bit about the different programs that they offer throughout the year. And then on May 11th, we are going to have a Grazing Lands Wildlife Program own a highlight with Dr. Hans Ellington. And he's going to be talking about identifying predators involved in livestock loss. So that's May 11th. And then our next Bluebird Watchers program is going to be March 27th. It's a Saturday, it's online at one o'clock. So you can register for that. And as at the end of this show, I'll send or I'll share a link that'll um, tell you where to go to see all these and to register. These programs are gonna be going through June for the Bluebird Watchers. And the next one has been scheduled for March 27th. Another good program, if you haven't checked it out, you should, is the Alvin C. Warnick Beef Cattle Reproductive Management online video series that the South Florida Beef Forge program in collaboration with uh, many other people have put together. The link for that you'll see there at the bottom of this flyer, the South Florida Beef Forge website. And recently we had a meeting to talk about the Youth Field Day and it is a go. It's going to be June 29th. Here at the center in person is our plan. And here you'll see the classes offering we're offering this year. Help, the calf is stuck. It's gonna be talking about what is normal birthing and strategies to assist cows when problems arise. Calf 911. Caring for newborn calves, dobies, and addressing health problems. Stick it out in the cow pens. Bleeding vaccinations and handling pharmaceuticals and medical equipment. So you want to start a business. Writing a plan, creating a budget, understanding assets and liabilities, knowing your numbers and your competitive advantages. And then bluebirds on the ranch. Bluebird biology, nest boxes, monitoring, um, and then they'll be talking about some of the research that they are presently doing with bluebirds. So that's all the events that I have to announce today. And as I mentioned earlier, here's our website and other ways that you can follow what's going on here on social media. And if by chance you don't receive our regular emails, please just shoot me an email to the ona at ifis.ufl.edu and we'll get you signed up so that you can hear all the great news about things happening here at the center. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next month.